Welcome to Military Faith and Spiritual Resilience. This is Elizabeth Fulgaro. With me today is Erin Nichols, nutrition and fitness coach and Gold Star Wife. Hi, Erin. Hi, Elizabeth. I'm so excited to continue with you today. There's so much more to your story and Sam's. So at the end of our last episode, we were talking about Sam's second deployment, uh, and he had been doing some humanitarian aid with the Marines. What happened next on his Marine journey? So he came home from that deployment. Uh, it was in the middle of July. Uh, what year are we in now? That would have been 2006. Thank you. Yeah, summer of 2006. And so we moved back down. We got the same apartment that we had had, the, uh, the same apartment complex. Complex, I said that weird. The same apartment complex as uh, our second time living there. So we lived there three separate times. Is this Pendleton now? Yeah, but in Oceanside. So in we, Oceanside. We never lived okay. on base. Mm-hmm. Um, we always lived in town in Oceanside. Um, so yeah, the second two times that we lived there, we lived in the same complex. And uh, nice, just really nice little community. And uh, yeah, I chose it online. And um, what made me fall in love with it, uh, both of us, was we're from Northern California. And we're used to some greenery. And Quite honestly, Southern California is not that much to look at unless you're actually looking at the water. And the green, any of the green that you do see is sage green, you know, Um, and uh, unless you're looking at a palm, but that's 50 feet up. And so this apartment complex had grass and some oak trees and just foliage, (laughs) colorful foliage. And so it felt much more like home. Yes. And then we just, we really liked the community of people there, the um, the manager and, and, and all that. Um, and so, yeah, just back to, back to life, back to all the, all the little kids, you know, had grown up a little bit. Um, oh, sure. And, you know, the, the kids that we played with in the pool, um, <laughs> most of them were cousins. Sweet. Um, and so, yeah, we had the tamale kids. Um, Wednesdays and Sundays, the brother and sister would come door to door and ask you how many tamales you wanted. And uh, they'd take, you know, it was like $5 for four tamales, and then they'd come back with piping hot tamales. Nice. What's for dinner? Knock, knock, knock. Tamales. (laughs) Yay. (laughs) So, um, yeah, it was just kind of life, you know, um, as we knew it down there. And then he was, so he got home in July, and then he was supposed to be getting out in October. So he'd gone to... Boot camp, I think October 13th. So his EAS date, his end of active service date would have been October 13th, 2006. And, or 2007. 2007. 2007. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, but then this deployment came up. And just the timing of things. So he was an NCO at this time. He was a corporal. And he had... Right after that, the MEW deployment, he uh, went to artillery uh, artillery training school and became a section chief. So he's a corporal in E4, and that's actually a staff sergeant, E6 billet. And so he was basically um, in charge of a gun, of a howitzer and the team to run it. Um, in convoy terms, he was a vehicle commander. Okay. Um, because both times that he deployed to Iraq, they weren't deployed as artillery. They were deployed as provisional MPs. But what happened was there was a lot of guys that were the same rank as him that were getting out like a few months before him. So they were getting out in like the summer, and then his date wasn't until October. And... Basically, he had to have his contract extended by three months because they needed to deploy again. And there was a lack of NCOs, so it was like they really needed him to be there. And so the choice was essentially go back on a Mew, which probably was going to get extended to a year. Oh, a long time. Which means he was going to have to extend anyway. Or go back to Iraq do seven months, and then they would get home in October. Instead of separating in October, they would get home in October, and then those last few months would be the separation process. So it looked similar, not identical, but not bad. 
Right. And it was essentially the difference between a year on the ship, which he hated, or seven months in Iraq, where at least he was doing something productive, kind of. And Mm -hmm. as I mentioned, when he was in the Philippines doing that disaster relief, he said it was the worst four days of his life. Yeah, worse than combat for him then, right? So, you know, had that not happened, happened, maybe he would have been more okay with the Mew, but he was miserable on the Mew. He hated it so much because there's there's nothing to do. On the ship. Yeah. The, the, the Navy runs the ship, and the Marines are waiting to get to wherever they're going. Um, and so he just he just hated that. That would be hard for your warrior man. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, yeah, it, there were a lot of pep talks that were having to happen, you know, on during that deployment, during, uh, during the Mew, uh, just because he was just so frustrated and... and bored. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. So, um, so yeah. So then he was going to go for his third deployment, second time to Iraq. And he was now a section chief. Where did, what, when did he arrive in Iraq? I think it was right before Christmas or even right before Thanksgiving. So of 2006. Of and 2006. To, yeah. yeah. It was late 2006. So like end of November, so my birthday is end of November, and I want to say it was like right before Thanksgiving and my birthday. Um, and then, yeah. How like were that. you on this deployment? Because now he's back in a combat zone. <laughs> it was it it felt way easier than it should have. Okay. Yeah. You know what? Now I'm thinking about it. It must have been January that they left. January, February. Yeah, we we had that Christmas. That was like our one Christmas we got to have. We have a really cute picture of us. <laughs> oh, I want to see it. <laughs> Actually, yeah, we did we did our own Thanksgiving. Yeah, we did our own Thanksgiving that year. We stayed we stayed home because we learned our lesson of trying to drive from Southern California to Northern California the day before Thanksgiving. Yes. A seven and a half hour drive took thirteen hours. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, so that he didn't actually leave until early in the year of 2007, but, okay. um, anyhow, um, yeah, it, it felt normal. It felt like, all right, this is the last one. Let's get it over with. And now where I had always been the one that like had that wall up and, and, uh, I mean, I had the wall, but I was always a basket case too before he left. When he was still there, you know, it was the guard wasn't up yet. And I remember him being like concerned and even a little bit hurt of like, why aren't you a basket case? Oh. <laughs> kind of like what? <laughs> you know, it was almost like I had become jaded to the process. Sure. And I was just, you know, I was just an old Marine wife at that point. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. old Marine wife at 23. There you go. And I knew, you know, I, I knew what could happen. I really tried not to think about what could happen. But, um, and I remember thinking, like, why is this so easy? Why does this seem so easy this time? But, I mean, that feels a lot better. <laughs> it felt a lot better than being miserable. But we still had, as as we as we got closer and closer to the actual day that he was leaving, March 26th was the day that they left. There you, okay. I know exactly. I had to drop him off on March 25th, though. March 25th was the last week, day we were together. I dropped him off late that night, and then they left from Riverside on the 26th. It's my friend's birthday, March 26th. So that was the day. Um, but as it got closer and closer, it got it got harder. Um, even, even like being intimate got harder because it was like him leaving the, in the anticipation of him leaving was not a pleasurable thing. So to then engage in physical pleasure, like it didn't even feel right. It was like, all we wanted to do was just like cuddle. It makes sense. Bury your heads in each other's shoulders. Yeah, it makes sense. So he deploys. Mm-hmm. And he's supposed to come home in October. Mm-hmm. K 
can you share what happened? So July 24th, about five months in, I was working at Dimple Records, which is a local record store just recently closed down. And my sister-in-law, sister-in-law-to-be, Brandy, was my boss. And so still hanging out with Donnie, but now also hanging out with his his wife-to-be, Brandy. And uh, I I usually started around like 10 10 or 11 in the morning, Um, would spend the evenings, late nights with Brandy and Donnie drinking, doing Mad Libs and playing Wii Sports, and um, not getting a lot of sleep, waking up with a headache most days. Is this because of the deployment? Because Sam's gone. Uh, Probably, yeah. Uh, There's probably some numbing going on. It was also probably like the, um, if I ever sowed any wild oats, this was it. Okay. Um, I mean, we weren't like we weren't doing like crazy stuff or anything, but you know, for 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 me, that was probably yeah the the wildest I ever got. But um, I mean, still hanging out at my father in law's house with my brother in law and <laughs> just <laughs> doing Mad Libs. <laughs> you are crazy. We were you're you know, just crazy. Yeah, I and mean, we were drinking rum and coke, but we were doing Mad Libs on the back patio. So <laughs> like, it wasn't. It was still somewhat wholesome. But, um, yeah, so that morning I had gone to uh, Noah's Bagels and Starbucks, which are right next to each other, and um, I was walking back to my car across the parking lot, and as I, before I stepped into the parking lot, I see this Chevy Tahoe with Purple Heart license plate. And in deployment mode, I don't watch the news, I don't think about what could be, I try not, I just put my head down and do focus on whatever I'm focusing on. This time it was a little bit more debaucherous than the other times. And, but I noticed these plates and I looked at the woman driving and she was this blonde woman. She was maybe in her thirties. And I just remember thinking like, is that her purple heart? Is that her husband? Is that her dad? Like it, it, I thought about it. Yeah. I noticed her and I thought about it, which was odd. So then uh, a couple hours later I go to work and I was, um, I was on the floor straightening CDs, and um, my phone rang. Well, I'd forgotten to put my phone like in my purse in the back room. It was on. It was in my back pocket, um, which it shouldn't have been. But I was on the floor, so I look at it, and it's seven six zero seven two five number, Camp Pendleton. So, <laughs> took a deep breath. I was a key volunteer wife. So, which is kind of like an official phone tree. Um, so it was possible that it was just related to that and that there was some sort of message that I would have to then to disseminate to my wives. Um, but it was not. It was the leave behind major calling to tell me that Sam had been seriously injured. Oh my God. So uh, at that time, uh, I can't actually remember if I knew this at the time. But we lost four guys, three Marines and a Navy corpsman. And Sam was unconscious and had a broken arm and a broken leg. And that was what I knew at that point. So my sister-in-law was not there yet. I think she was working or would have worked the closing shift that day. So whoever was there, I was just like, Sam got hurt. I have to go. Just left. And that was the last time actually I stepped into that building for probably a decade. Um, but um, I went straight to my mother-in-law. She was a leasing manager at the apartments. So when, when she and I lived together, it was that same place. And so I went into the office and her now husband, who was the maintenance guy there, was there. And there were some other, there some residents or some potential residents. Somebody else was in the office. And I just like went in. I was like, "Can you guys meet me upstairs when you get a chance?" Mm. Uh, upstairs in in her apartment. So I get up there, and you know, I'm sure she knew what was up. I have no idea how she got rid of the people, but you know, tell them what's going on. Lost it, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so spent 
I don't know, a while with them. Um, one of the one of the worst parts in that moment and like that day was having to tell people. Hmm. Of course, like, it was already terrible, but now I have to share the terrible <laughs> with other people who love him. How do you even get that out? I don't know. <laughs> um, I uh, eventually, I, th- I think I was just kind of watching the clock and knowing like when my when my father in law was going to be home or when my brother in law was going to be home. So my brother in law and his girlfriend lived with my father in law. So I went over there first or next, and um, I think Donnie came home from work or whatever, and I just said, you know, something like, um, you know, like uh, we need, I need to talk to everybody. So it was, it was my father-in-law, my brother-in-law, and then his girlfriend, um, and so I told them, and you know, just shock. Um, my parents treated Sam, thought of Sam as their own son. So then the idea of having to tell them, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't deal with it that day. Um, I think eventually I ended up just calling my mom and say, hey, I'm going to spend the night over here, which because I was drinking with Donnie and Brandy most nights was not uncommon that I would spend the night over there <laughs> anyway. Um, and I just acted like everything was fine. Oh um, my, hard. Yeah. Well, yeah, it was just a short phone call. <laughs> um, the next day, um, the next day, Donnie went with me to go tell my parents. I almost think telling my parents was worse than t- telling his parents, to be honest. My parents, my mom in particular, just in general more uh emotional sentimental people not you I mean not, not to like no comparison of like love or anything like that just the way that they express their emotions sure. was is a lot different um so i mean basically all of our lives just stopped at that point um nobody could work um my oldest brother-in-law i think did continue working he was a server if he didn't work he didn't make money um as a server you don't get vacation pay or pto or anything like that um so that was on a tuesday long tuesday and wednesday really long i mean we basically just sat around the tv on doing whatever um so so they haven't given you updates you're just waiting we were just waiting at that point i i had probably had updates from the leave behind officer at camp pendleton at that point um but it wasn't until thursday morning that i got the call from the i guess he was the trauma surgeon i don't even know um at launch um in germany in germany yeah so basically um i didn't even i didn't even say what happened today I just, I just said his, his injuries, what they knew of his injuries. Um, the con- the vehicle in front of him, the Humvee in front of him was hit by a remote IED first. Sam was the vehicle commander of his vehicle. And so they were going to, you know, respond and go help their guys. And a second one was detonated. And it killed the kid behind him, Robert Lynch, instantly. It was on... The passenger side of the vehicle, the vehicle commander basically rides shotgun. And so it happened just a bit behind Sam. And you could see just based on his physical wounds, you could see how the blast happened and it, it instantly killed uh, Rob. So the other guys in Sam's vehicle had some minor like flesh wounds, shrapnel and things like that, but none of them were seriously injured. They all they all stayed in Iraq. Um, and then, as I said, in the vehicle in front, uh, the first vehicle, um, we lost two Marines and a corpsman in that vehicle. So um, I get the phone call around 7 in the morning on Thursday, and um, basically I found out how serious it is. Oh, Aaron. And he's in a coma, and he might not wake up. 
He has this type of brain injury that's called a diffuse axonal injury, which means that rather than having like a, like you have blunt force trauma and you have one area of significant injury um, where there's a lot of bleeding, where you can then remove the blood, open up the skull, release, relieve the pressure, and said it's pinpoint areas of bleeding throughout the brain. And there's basically nothing that you can do other than just kind of let it heal or not. Oh, dear. So we had the choice then of either waiting until Sunday to whoever wanted to go in the family, everybody go to Bethesda, Maryland, to the National Naval Medical Center on Sunday, or me and up to two other people would go um, would go to Germany first, likely only be there for 24 hours, and then turn around and go back to Bethesda. So the waiting around was the worst part. And so um, Donnie, his brother, and I were on a plane at 3 o'clock Thursday afternoon, headed out to D.C. first. My passport had expired. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> because I uh, I had gotten the pass my passport as a minor, and that expires when you're 18, apparently, <laughs> if you have one as a minor. Um, his was good, but they basically had to take, we had to go to the State Department, got an emergency issued uh, passport. And then, I mean, they, they did all this for us. A Marine came and picked us up, took us over to the Naval Annex. This lady had like everything that she needed, took a horrendous picture of me because I'd been traveling for like, like we left Sacramento around three in the afternoon. And then we landed at, um, I think Dulles at like 630 in the morning. Oh. Um, and so I looked a wreck. So fortunately, that passport was only good for 18 months. Oh, that's good. <laughs> my, my current passport looks a little better. Um, and then from there, we went back to the airport and, uh, and flew to Germany. Marine came and picked us up. We were hoping for a really cool German car. It ended up being a navy blue Ford Taurus, just like Donnie's. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, and then so the Marine liaison took us to Launch Duel. Uh, where we would see Sam for the first time. We're going to stop there because I want you to share, please, in the next episode yep. what happened next. Thank you, Aaron.